Welcome to the Mythical Ireland podcast and my name is Anthony Murphy. I'm recording this podcast on the evening of March the 18th, which if you've been following Mythical Ireland lately, you will know is or was at one time in Ireland known as Sheila's Day. Who is this Sheila? Well, Sheila, according to old tradition, was the wife of of St. Patrick. And uh, while the whole population of Ireland celebrates St. Patrick's Day, not very many people know that in pre-famine Ireland uh, there was a belief that Patrick was married and that his wife's name was Sheila and that her day of celebration was the day after St. Patrick's Day on March the 18th. Now the revelation... Uh, that St. Patrick had a wife, which kind of came to the public, uh, to, to to public knowledge uh, around St. Patrick's Day 2017, um, is exciting for a number of reasons. It was Shane Lahan, a folklorist from University College Cork, uh, who brought it to the world's attention. And he had uncovered pre-famine references to this widespread belief in the fact or the uh, the uh, the supposition that St. Patrick was married. Uh, at the time, that's last year, Lahan told the Irish Times that, you know, pre-famine, if you go back to the newspapers in Ireland, they talk not just about Patrick's Day, but also Sheila's Day. And Lahan said he came across numerous references that Sheila was thought to be Patrick's wife. The fact that we have Patrick and Sheila should be no surprise, he says, because that duality, that union of male and female together, is one of the strongest images that we have in our mythology. Now, although the devastating effects of the Great Famine on Irish culture might never be fully realised, uh, we have a significant example here of a folk belief that appears to have died out uh, in Ireland uh, at the time of the Great Famine. References to Sheila's Day were found in the Freeman's Journal of 1785, 1811 and 1841. But the feast day has been largely forgotten about in Ireland, according to Lahan. Now, some time ago, I wrote about the story of the twining branches from the tale of Deirdre and the children of Ishnach, and how memories of this creation myth were brought by Irish emigrants to Nova Scotia. The story of Sheila seems to follow a similar fate. Before the famine, which happened in the late 1840s, the celebration of St. Patrick's Day continued into March 18th for his wife's special day, Sheila's Day. Now, I'm not entirely sure from what I've read whether she was a saint or not, but I'm, I'm assuming so, St. Sheila's Day. And of course, um, you know, because St. Patrick's Day um, I think it's always during Lent, isn't it? Because Easter is the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox and the vernal equinox is March 20th um, you know a lot of people would be fasting or you know would abstain and I think there was special dispensation granted to the uh, the natives um, on St. Patrick's Day to, to have um, some alcohol and of course even to this day Irish people tend to have a few drinks or in some cases, a few dozen drinks on St. Patrick's Day. And uh, anyway, that dispensation seems to have travelled on into the next day, into Sheila's Day, where some people uh, might have uh, participated in what we might call the hair of the dog or the, the day after, um, and uh, a little bit of further drinking. After the famine, the tradition seems to have died out here, that is, the tradition of Sheila's Day. But Irish migrants who ended up in such places as Newfoundland, Canada and Australia brought the tradition with them. 
Lahan says perhaps the most enduring legacy of Sheila is the so-called Sheila's Brush. This is the name given by Newfoundlanders and Atlantic Canadians to a winter snowstorm that falls after St. Patrick's Day. Now, I was told by somebody on my Facebook page today that, indeed, this was known about in the pre-famine uh, Irish community that existed on Newfoundland. Now, I didn't know there was a pre-famine Irish uh, community or a community of Irish descent on Newfoundland. So I'm learning here anyway as we go along. Sometimes this was referred to as Sheila's broom or if the snowstorm is mild with only a bare covering of snow, Sheila's brush. And it is still referred to respectfully by meteorologists and fishermen in that part of the world. A somewhat obscure and tenuous but perhaps very important connection is made by Lahan between St. She St. Sheila or Sheila and the hugely interesting archaeological manifestation that also bears her name, which is the Sheila Nagig. Now, the Sheila Nagig is a basic medieval carving of a woman exposing her genitalia. These images are often considered to be quite grotesque. They're quite shocking when you see them first. Uh, they're often found now... Uh, you know, they've been found in the walls of churches, uh, examples uh, locally. Um, one in Drogheda was found in the wall of a house on, on John Street and was moved when that street was being demolished for the construction of a road in the 1970s to Drogheda Museum or Millmount Museum in Drogheda. Uh, another example at Rossnery was on the wall of the old mill house is kept for uh, safekeeping there by the owners. Um, there's an example of a shield and a gig on a standing stone in the churchyard on the hill of Tara. Now we look at them as very much examples of old women showing young women how to give birth. They are vernacular folk deities associated with pregnancy and birth, according to Lahan. And he believes that the tradition of Sheila could and should be revived and embraced in Ireland. And this is Lahan's words. Uh, Sheila represented, for women in particular, a go-to person because she represented the female. The Sheila Nagig is a really important part of medieval folk tradition. She is an important folk deity. The figure of Sheila was perhaps much bigger than suggested by the scant mentions we find in the old newspaper accounts. She would have been massively important. She represents a folk personification allied to what can be termed the female cosmic agency and being such would have played a major role in people's everyday lives. It is a pity that the day has died out, but maybe we will revive it, he says. My own view is that the revival of the tradition of a female deity equal in status to Patrick might very well be important to the spiritual well-being of a country which has been very heavily influenced by patriarchal religious zeal for centuries. An influence that is seen by some as a contributory factor in many of Ireland's ills. The symbolic importance of Patrick, who was, by the way, ironically, a Romano-British immigrant to these shores, uh, cannot be understated in the milieu of a nation defined for so long by its trenchant support for the male-dominated Roman church. Now we have the chance to reconcile the tradition of an almost forgotten woman into the complex folk fabric of a fractured cultural history, a history that, it must be borne in mind, was vibrantly aware of the necessity for accessibility to the feminine deity in most of its past eras. The patriarchal influence of Rome did not decimate the ancient divine feminine. Rather, it forced upon us some sort of collective obeisance to the supremacy of the omniscient and jealous male god of the Old Testament, forcing the old indigenous female deities such as the Kalyach and Sheila into the shadows. And according to Gyaroj or Kralach, Kralach in the book of the Kalyach, there was suspicion and even hostility to the feminine, which many leading Christian thinkers and writers expressed in the early medieval period. <coughs> the female wasn't altogether banished 
but rather was revealed in the guise of that was somewhat familiar with reflections of the ancient goddesses of old, but very much dressed in the raiment of a woman whose power was contingent upon the emanations of the Catholic patriarchy. Now, this is a theme, you know, that has come up in the news very, very recently with a speech given by a former Irish president, Mary McAleese, who had been invited to speak at the Why Women Matter conference in Rome. But at at the last minute, um, due to the intervention of one of the cardinals, um, it was supposed to be held in the Vatican, but this cardinal, um, you know, um, suggested a change of venue. Um, so I, ga- I gather they must have known that Mrs. McAleese was going to say something controversial. It's interesting. Mary McAleese um, is a Catholic and uh, born and raised as a Catholic and continues uh, in the Catholic faith. But she's got a lot to say about uh, the male domination of that church. And I suppose a lot of people would feel that um, the church must reform and must include women in order to f- survive and thrive in Ireland. She told, or she's quoted in the Irish Times as, say, as, as saying that the Catholic Church has long since been a primary global carrier of the virus of misogyny. And the cure for this, she says, is freely available and that's called equality. Um, she said that the church lags noticeably behind the world's advanced nations in the elimination of discrimination against women. Its overt clerical patriarchalism acts as a powerful break on dismantling the architecture of misogyny wherever it is found. And these are Mary McAleese's words. She said that the church, which regularly criticises the secular world for its failure to deliver on human rights, has almost no culture of critiquing itself. It has a hostility to internal criticism, which fosters blinkered servility and which borders on institutional idolatry. But, you know, the church is beset by what she calls toxins such as misogyny and homophobia. You know, and the challenge really is, you know, to um, what she says, you know, undo this process whereby Christ has been kept out of the church and bigotry has been kept in. But anyway, it's an interesting time. Um, I think it's fascinating that Sheila should come into popular consciousness at this time. Um, And I think it's interesting the fact that, you know, um, the culture that believed in her um, seems to have almost completely vanished from these shores, you know. Further to the potential revival of the tradition of Sheila here is the possibility that incorporating her into our national celebrations could become a hugely significant act. We have here the very vivid and exciting possibility of activating or reactivating a feminine energy that is, as C.G. Young might have suggested, of supreme importance for the ultimate rehabilitation of the modern human soul through the reconciliation of the masculine and feminine elements in life. 
can one yet countenance the notion of a St. Patrick's Day and a St. Sheila's Day? A national holiday for Ireland spanning two days, recognising the male and the female and allowing both to hold equal court in the hearts and minds of Irish people and their descendants and friends all around the world. And of course, the St. Patrick's Day celebrations uh, already have, you know, quite often extended into several days. It, of course, it depends on when St. Patrick's Day falls. If St. Patrick's Day falls on a Friday, a Saturday, a Sunday or a Monday in particular, uh, the celebrations seem to last for more than one day. Um, I'm not sure, um, you know, what people in general might think of that. We... I, I caused a little bit of controversy on my Facebook page a couple of days ago when in reference to this whole article, this blog post that I had written about Sheila's Day, I had suggested that St. Patrick's Day wasn't really a Christian celebration anymore and I was challenged on this by a follower who said that that was like saying Christmas isn't a Christian celebration. And who felt that you know political correctness had uh, had entered the uh, the discussion, but really what I was talking about wasn't the origin of St Patrick's Day. Obviously, it's associated with Christianity. St Patrick is um, the figure who is credited with bringing Christianity to Irish shores. For the past 1600 years, um, you know, Ireland has been largely a Christian nation. Um, I think that now in, moder in modern day Ireland, St. Patrick's Day is not an overtly Christian celebration, but rather it has become uh, a national holiday. And a sort of a patriotic time. A time when people celebrate being Irish and Irishness. And of course it extends much further than the appeal of one individual who, as I say, is credited with introducing Christianity to Ireland. Um, it extends nowadays, I believe, the modern celebration of St. Patrick's Day is much, much bigger than the celebration of this one individual and the celebration of his bringing of Christianity to Ireland. And one of the reasons I say that is because a great deal of people in Ireland no longer practice either Christianity or Catholicism. And I know that Catholicism is a branch of Christianity. I think it's safe to say that a great deal of people have moved away from the church and, you know, um, that is evidenced by falling attendances and um, falling uh, vocations, ordinations in the church. Um, a great deal of people today, I don't know about majority and I don't have statistics, but I think a great deal of people are rather agnostic or atheistic. Uh, in relation to their faith. Um, a lot of people are still attending Masses or attending the sacraments. Maybe maybe they're bringing their children to First Communion and Confirmation and all the rest, but they're not really practising Christians. Uh, they don't regularly attend Mass. They don't regularly pray. And they don't, essentially don't believe uh, in the things that I suppose they're supposed to believe in in order to be considered Christians or Catholics. Um, you know, the fact that there is such a huge celebration on St. Patrick's Day 
mainly manifested in the parades in all the cities and towns and villages around Ireland and the huge crowds that turn out to those and the fact that it is a, a national holiday in Ireland uh, is testament to the fact that I think it has grown into a much bigger thing than a purely uh, religious celebration notwithstanding the fact that that is its origin and I suppose that will always be its origin uh, it always relates back to Christianity it's just that in the words of R.E.M. people are losing their religion I wonder myself how far back the tradition of Sheila might extend into the past in Ireland. Uh, certainly for me it's been fascinating. Don't forget that at some point in the church's history, I don't know when because I'm not an expert on church history. and I'm not an expert on Christianity in Ireland. But at some stage, um, celibacy in the priesthood was introduced and that in my own personal opinion has been at the root of a lot of problems in the church remember that I was born and raised as a Catholic um, I have some familiarity uh, with these things although as I say the disclaimer is that I'm not an expert so another female figure of some substantial standing and importance in previous times was St. Bridget. And, you know, I think it's curious too that, you know, there are pockets of very strong devotion to the cult of Bridget in Ireland. And the two probably best examples of that are Kildare Village, uh, which was the location of Bridget's Monastery, and the village of Fohart, outside Dundalk in County Louth, which is where she was said to have been born. Because um, I think that Bridget, you know, to a large extent, had fallen out of... Um, sort of mainstream popularity although as I said notwithstanding the fact that you know the, the folk traditions around her the making of the crosses etc etc uh, have continued in, in a lot of parishes and a lot of places into modern times so I would kind of equate Bridget a little bit with Sheila I think that Bridget has suffered a serious diminution and I think that Sheila, um, uh, you know, as we say, has largely disappeared. So I think it would be favourable to at least discuss the possibility of a re-emergence and a revivification, a revitalization of some of the feminine figures of the past. And I'm not necessarily talking directly in relation to Christianity I think that it's it's important that we have I mean the church never the church in Ireland never let go of the feminine because she was present uh, in a way in a, in, in a form in the figure of you know the Virgin Mary and you know, such was the standing of Mary that she was, I think, uh, and again, I'm not an expert, but she was in the Catholic faith considered sort of a co a co redemptrix along with Jesus. In other words, you could pray to Mary for the forgiveness of your sins. Um. Anyway, I'd like to see the reemergence of some of these, um, uh, substantial female deities of the past. Bridget, uh, pre-Christianity, was a, uh, 
uh, a goddess of the two headed Danon. She was a daughter of Dogda Moor, or the, the Dogda, the great uh, chief of the gods, as it were. And of course, you only have to look at the Danon mythology to realize that um, there was an abundance of both male and, uh, pardon me, uh, an abundance of both male and female deities, a pantheon. And sometimes um, it's difficult to see who were the, the most supreme among those. It is widely reported that the two at Adanan take their name from a goddess, a sort of an overarching mother goddess figure called Danu, the two at Adanan. Um, and indeed, Ireland's Irish name, Era, is taken from an ancient goddess, a two at Adanan goddess who was said to have been one of a triune of goddesses, Era, Banba and Fola. And I was particularly delighted lately uh, to learn that one of the local secondary schools here in Drogheda, St Oliver's Community College, uh, has given, uh, every year they give names to the various classes. And uh, th in the forthcoming year, in September of 2018, the first year classes will all be named after Irish gods and goddesses, mostly it has to be said, goddesses. And the names of the classes are Fola, Era, Banba, Danu, Macha, Lear, Bran, Breed, Balor and Etain. Now, there are only three male names on that list out of ten. So seven are goddesses. Um... Probably a little bit curious as to why Balor is on there. Balor is not a Daedanon figurehead. Balor is a Fomorian uh, figurehead. And they were like a more evil race, as it were, who battled against the two of Daedanon at the second battle of Moitura. Um, the most local of those might consider to be Etain who's strongly associated with Sheed and Brogar and Newgrange. Um, and Breed, well, there's that Bridget. She was the precursor to the saint. Um, B or I fought a, I fought a D. Um, I think that's sort of um, a corruption of Bridget. B-R-I-G-H-I-D. And Bridget, as I said, before there was a goddess Bridget, Oh, sorry, before there was a saint, Bridget, there was a goddess. Maka is another one that could be considered to be reasonably local. She's associated with Arma, uh, and uh, that's only, well, I suppose it's only about uh, 30 miles or 50 kilometres north of here. Anyway, a sign, perhaps, that we haven't forgotten some of the eminent... Uh, feminine deities and female personages from our cultural past. Uh, a revitalization of Sheila uh, is an interesting possibility um, and one that might go some length to healing this uh, rift that we have uh, or this difficulty that we have in, in relation to the recent um, history of the church in Ireland uh, which in my view and in, in my own very personal opinion um, and I, I think it's an opinion that's probably shared by a lot of people stems from the fact that the church is overtly uh, male in its um, uh, structure and its makeup uh, it, it almost excludes the female um, completely. Um, and so Mary McAleese's comments, I think, are timely as well. All of this, all of these things are happening uh, at the same time, and I don't think that is coincidental. One of the curious things about Sheila is that she doesn't seem to crop up. 
So if you are a student of Irish mythology, and I'm a student but only a, a novice, um, uh, in other words, I've only spent perhaps about 19 years uh, reading about Irish mythology, which makes me a novice. Um, I haven't been grounded in a sort of a, a um, domestic or an indigenous uh, upbringing uh, with the myths and the folk beliefs of the past. Most of my knowledge is knowledge that I have learned from reading about all this in books. But the point is that if, as a student of Irish mythology, you wish to learn about this Sheila, Patrick's wife, you will find little or nothing about her in the books um, that are uh, popularly available um, in relation to Irish and Celtic mythology and history and folk belief, etc., etc. Uh, and I think that's fascinating. If, however, you wanted to get a very strong indication or in relation to the depth of uh, belief and um, following of an ancient female deity, uh, then you will find an abundance of um, information and writings about the Kalyak, uh, the ancient goddess of the land, who later became a sort of a sovereignty goddess and who, who preferred the right to rule upon uh, the male um, kings, etc., etc. Uh, you will find lots and lots of information about the Kalyak. Uh, and there is one lady around whom um, tradition uh, did not die out with the Great Famine or with mass emigration. Um, and uh, her her name and place names associated with her and indeed folklore associated with her can be found in many, many parts of Ireland. I strongly recommend, if you're interested in following that particular line of inquiry, uh, two books that I've been reading that I find very, very interesting. I'm just uh, making sure I have the titles right here. One is called The Book of the Kalyak, Stories of the Wise Woman Healer. And the author is, uh, as I mentioned earlier on in the podcast, Garoj O'Krulik. Uh, the other, which is um, a little bit less academic, um, so the Book of the Kalyak is quite academic, but it is nonetheless fascinating and extremely well researched and extremely well written. Um, a book that sort of more tells a story uh, about Ireland and that is fascinating and entertaining and again extremely well written is by Patricia Monaghan, the late Patricia Monaghan. And that book is called The Red Haired Girl from the Bog. Uh, and I've been enjoying that very, very much so. Um, Monaghan um, was a very good storyteller and um, seems to have been very in touch with uh, some of these traditions through her own experience. Anyway, perhaps if you've got any opinions about this whole thing about Sheila and the revitalization and the reintroduction of the image and some of the traditions of Sheila back into the popular consciousness of Ireland and Irish people uh, and perhaps some sort of a cele national celebration. I'd be interested in hearing your opinions. Um, it's, it's a fascinating topic, I think. Um... But anyway, let me know what you think. I'd be delighted to hear your opinion one way or the other. Perhaps some people will feel that this whole thing will, will denigrate the celebration of St. Patrick. And of course, we can't forget that a lot of people today are still um, 
are still followers of the faith and are still uh, staunch and devout Catholics and that's perfectly okay by me. I'm not uh, um, going to judge anybody for their belief or their non-belief. Um, but uh, you might have opinions about Sheila. And especially if you're in Newfoundland or you're in those parts of the world where perhaps a little bit of the tradition of Sheila is still alive, uh, you might inform us a little bit about that because we'd be interested in hearing it. And um, I've had lots of comments in the last 24 hours about uh, Sheila's brush. And so it's been snowing today, quite ironically, or maybe quite coincidentally, and maybe it's not a coincidence at all. Uh, it's been snowing. We had severe uh, a snowstorm in Ireland um, at the end of February into the beginning of March, referred to as the beast from the east, and we saw the worst snow in uh, 36 years since 1982 and um, you know here we are two weeks later just over two weeks later and it's snowing again but this time it has to be said a much lighter covering of snow what might be honestly referred to as Sheila's brush um, so uh, thanks again for listening uh, if you're Interested in finding out more, as usual, uh, the Mythical Ireland website can be found on mythicalireland.com or mythicalireland.ie. I'm on Facebook, that's facebook.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. I'm on YouTube, again, just search for Mythical Ireland. And I'd be delighted to hear your feedback through any of those channels. The email address for any comments or queries is mythicalireland at gmail.com. This is my fourth podcast and in the very near future I am going to have a podcast where I'm going to try and answer some of your questions. Now I have a few questions but I'm trying to build up a stock of questions before making a full podcast. If you have questions that you think I might be able to answer or that you'd be interested in hearing my opinions on and uh, again this comes with a disclaimer I'm only a student. I'm only studying this stuff. I'm not an academic. It's more of a passion and a hobby and a sideline for me than it is, at the moment anyway, than it is a vocation or a career. Uh, however, if there's anything that you'd like me to try and answer, maybe you'd send me an email to mythicalireland at gmail.com. This has been podcast number four from Mythical Ireland. I hope to hear from you all very soon. In the meantime, I hope you had a fantastic St. Patrick's Day and I wish you all the best for this St. Sheila's Day. And by the time I get this uh, onto uh, online, it will no doubt be the 19th. Thanks a million, everybody.